figure all this stuff out. When to use LLCs, corporations, land trusts, things like that. You teach people how to do this themselves so they can do it themselves. You, like I said, you can turn a lot of those so-called negatives into positives. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. This show is created to help business owners start or grow the real estate investing business by bringing you guests. They can share their journey with you so you can learn not only from their successes, but more importantly, potentially their failures. So I want to encourage you guys that there's unlimited potential and that you can get anywhere faster by working smarter. So hopefully this conversation will prove that to you and help you work smarter. Uh, so remember, when you want to get somewhere and get something done, don't ask, how can I get there? But more importantly, who can get me there? So I'm Tony Javier, your host, 20 year real estate investor, mostly known as the TV guy. So if you guys want to dominate your market with TV commercials, go to 10xtv.co. We have some joint venture partnerships and a lot of great stuff that we're doing for real estate investors around the country. So love to talk to you about that. So super excited today to have on our show, Clint Coons. What's going on, Clint? Hey, Tony. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Good having you. So it's been good chatting with you offline a little bit. You have a monster business. You probably have more employees than anybody that I can think of that's been on our show, which is amazing. I'm sure it's a little brain damage, but it's probably worth it. You got over close to 500, I think over 500 uh, employees now working with real estate investors on asset protection, tax planning, and your real estate investor yourself, which is super cool. So we have a lot to talk about. So I guess let's rewind and kind of start where you, like how you started the real estate investing, asset protection, and tax planning game how you got into real estate and just kind of give people a, an overview of, uh, of who you are. Sure. So the real estate really began with my parents. My dad was a real estate investor and, and I got a taste for it, you know, basically an indentured servant for 27 years working on his properties. He just did the single family route, buy a property, rehab it, rent it out. And so through that experience, when I graduated law school, I realized, hey, there's an opportunity here because so many investors like my father, they own pretty much everything in their own name. And they had a, a good advisors. My grandfather was an attorney, my dad's dad. And he never once sat down with them and said, you know, you ought to protect your stuff here. Because I mean, let's face it, my brother and I, we were huge liabilities for my dad. I mean, we would do stupid stuff, like go to his apartment building and have his apartment manager buy us beer and then bring our friends in. And so our friends would pay for the beer because now they had to connect. And you know, if anything would have happened, that would all rolled back up on my father. And so when I graduated law school, one of the first things I started doing was protecting his assets. And then I realized, hey, there's a, probably a lot of other people out there like him that own real estate in their own name. They don't appreciate the liability. So I built this firm with my partner, Toby Mathis, on the foundation of helping real estate investors figure all this stuff out, when to use LLCs, corporations, land trusts, things like that. And then along the way, I mean, the reason we're up to 500 employees is we realize, hey, there's another side to this. It's the tax side. And, and we create structures and then our client would take it to their CPA and their CPA didn't understand it. And he was typically down on it. So we decided to build out a tax practice inside of our firm. And so I had all this built out. But then along the way, I started, you know, investing myself and I rapidly came to realize that I was doing it all wrong. That is, I was telling people, teaching people strategies on how to protect themselves and, and address their taxes. But I didn't realize that as an active investor, that some of the things that I were teaching people was actually hurting them on their ability to acquire more property. I mean, if you say, hey, you want to reduce your taxes, everyone's going to say, yeah, I want to reduce it down to zero. Sounds intriguing. But at the end of the day, does it help you get to where you want to go with your investing? So if you're somebody who's using qualified mortgage lenders to put all your deals together, you want your returns to look a certain way. And so once I figured out that component, my own investing took off. And so it started with flipping real estate in the Las Vegas market back in 2009, 10 and 11. And then we started buying single families, multifamily properties, commercial properties, self-storage, and you know all other kinds of different investments as well, warehouses, mobile home parks, and through that process, I've learned a lot along the way. And so at Anderson, you know, yeah, we have 500 employees, but what makes us so unique is our approach. Our approach is about asset protection. It's about tax planning, but it's also about business planning. And that's that third leg of the the stool, as I like to refer to it, that a lot of people just don't understand. What I love about, I mean, there's so many things I love about real estate, but the ability to save money on taxes with having an asset you can depreciate properly to me is a game changer. I mean, being able to make a lot of money in real estate and pay almost no money in taxes to me is, is a big thing. So you said something important. It was, how do you show banks that you have money 
so mm -hmm. that, or that you're making money rather, so you're able to get a loan, but then also pay as little in taxes as you possibly can. And I know for me, you know, I bought a commercial building a couple of years ago, put, was supposed to only put 900,000 into it, but we ended up putting like a million and a half into it. It was a crazy project, but it, it turned out pretty well. So we're able to take a lot of that million and a half and depreciate it and take it over a couple of years of income, right? And now we're doing that with single family too, where we're keeping a lot of properties, taking the renovations and using bonus depreciation on the components that we can in order to save money on taxes. So above and beyond that, and you can expand on that if you want to, above and beyond that, how do you also advise your clients saving taxes, you know, just kind of from a high level view? Well, really what I want to look at is, you know, the individual and, and what type of lenders are going to be working with. And so what do you want your 1040 to look like when you have to go in and apply for that loan? Because you got that debt to income ratio you're going to run up against. And what will lenders add back in to your income to bump it up. As you brought up, you know, depreciation, that's always going to get added back in. But you find a lot of investors I work with, they're small business owners or they have some side gig going. And there's always this tug, hey, I can write off this, 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 and this, and I can reduce my taxes down to zero. I get it. I used to do that. But the problem is when you go in to apply for a loan, they see the fact that you have zero income. You can sit there and argue all day long. Hey, I actually make money. It just doesn't show up in my taxes. And then they think you're, you know, either you're into prostitution or you're a drug dealer doing some illicit activity because that's what doesn't show up on taxation on taxes. So that is the problem that I see a lot of people fall into. It's like selling a business. I was talking to this business owner the other day and a CPA told him to write off all this stuff. And he said, that's fine. You can do that. But you know, do you want to sell this company in a few years? And he said, yeah, that's my intention. I said, well, you're not going to get there following his advice because by taking all those deductions, you're going to reduce your EBITDA. And when you go to sell, most of the time, it's going to be a multiple, which means your net income. And if you expense everything out the way you're planning to do, and it's going to hurt you long-term when you're trying to gross up the value of that company for sale. And it's no different the way we approach taxation. So one of the things I tell people a lot of times is how does that income hit your 1040? Hold your property through an entity that's treated it as a partnership for federal tax purposes. I mean, this one's so simple. You see so many investors, they hold them through disregarded entities or in their own name, shows up on their Schedule E or their 1040 page one. You automatically get a 30%, 25 to 30% haircut on your income if you're using a qualified mortgage lender to do your next deal when your income shows up there. If you take all those same properties and you hold them through a partnership entity, then that income shows up on page two as a line item and you don't get a haircut. So a little move like that can bump your income by 25%. So as you're growing and you run up against that debt to income ratio, this is, these are the tricks that are going to help you. Yeah. So explain that to people that didn't understand that. Cause I understand it. Cause I just did that recently where I was getting turned down for loans from banks and I, I have good income when I wasn't getting turned down. Actually, I was, they were asking me for taxes, insurance, and a principal and interest statement from the bank on every single property I own. And I didn't want to do that for a hundred plus properties. So I did a partnership so that it would show up on the partnership return. So that way I didn't have to line item everything out. And and I think there was an income component to it as well, because they weren't adding back in the principal I was paying down because you're getting income on that, even though you're paying it down and it's not an expense. Is that what you're referring to? And can you, can you expand on that a little bit to make sure yeah. people understand that? You know, when you first start now, or maybe you just want that cheaper money you're going to go the qualified mortgage route, which is the Freddie Fannie stuff that they underwrite. And when you go that route, then under those guidelines, they look at your 1040 and they see where the income comes in. And they're going to say, all right, if the income's coming in on Schedule E of your 1040 on the first page where you had everything lined out, then they have to hold back 25% for vacancies. Hmm. So if you choose to put your income there, they're going to take a 25% haircut. Now, granted, if you take that same individual like yourself, not to mention all the, the, the asks that you get from the uh, broker, if you take that same income and you put it on the second page of that Schedule E. It's li there's one line. You just put a number in there, which consolidates all of that. You don't take that same haircut because when they underwrite their guidelines, there's a certain way they have to underwrite it if it's on page one versus the income that shows up on page two. Mm -hmm. So to get yourself a, a greater <clears throat> boost, I like to see it on page two. But then as you, you know, as you grow and you start looking at other deals, granted, you're going to, if you're not working with the qualified mortgage mortgages, and you're doing a non-QM loan, 
which you know you're going to pay a little more, but those are going to be those asset based, experience based loans, as I'm sure you're doing, uh, just like I'm doing when you when you're buying a package of properties or you're doing a multi, you're going in there and they're going to evaluate that on a different basis. But for a lot of people who are investing in single families and you're and you're going out there and obtaining a mortgage, this is important. Such as also another mistake I see people make. You know, you got this married couple. They're applying for a loan to buy their fourth investment property, and I and I look through their other deals and. And each and every deal, they put both of their names on there as if, well, if I don't go on, then I won't have any ownership interest if that person leaves me. You can take care of all that later on after the fact. But if you want to preserve your ability to each of you stack 10 of these qualified mortgages, which are the lower interest rates in your name, then you should only qualify one spouse on the loan. If you can do it, if you have two working spouses, just qualify one. You go one to one, one to one. So you can get 20 rather than 10 many times, which I've seen happen more often than not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could see why you're so busy because if you're able to portray how much is needed in the asset protection, the tax planning, the, I don't even think we talked about estate planning yet. Nope. I had my estate plan done, gosh, what's it been two years ago? It might've been closer to three years ago. And had something happened to me before I had that plan together, I mean, my stuff would have been a mess. And I still don't know if I got everything in there that I needed to, but I was able to structure to where something happened to me. It goes seamlessly to my wife. If something happens to me and my wife, it goes into a trust where my son is able to take advantage of it down the road and, and have those assets and it for, and if, and all of that to happen a little more seamlessly than if you don't have an estate plan set up. So, so tell me when you meet with most real estate investors, how many of them actually have an estate plan and kind of run, run us down the road of what that looks like. Yeah. You know, great. Right. Most of the real estate investors I meet with, they maybe have one or two entities or they haven't set up anything yet. And so what we're always looking at is, okay, how can we protect you first? Uh, asset protection. So that's going to typically be a combination of limited liability companies, a holding LLC that would own all the various LLCs where your assets are protected. And then we take that one limited liability company and we set up a living trust for our clients and we drop that one LLC into that living trust. And then when you're drafting out your trust, you have to be conscious of, you know, if I've built up this portfolio, who's going to manage that when I'm gone? Do, am I just going to allow someone to go in and sell it all and distribute out the cash? Maybe if that's what your goals are, or you don't care. But most people I run into, they want to create a legacy of wealth. And you can do that effectively through your living trust where you can preserve and protect those LLCs that hold your rental real estate so they can continue to be that little ATM that you've created for multiple generations. And to do that, you got to have an estate plan in place that that recognizes, you know, the real estate needs to be treated different than my personal residence or my cash. So I'll give you an example. So in my estate, we got a lot of properties as we were talking about. And the first thing I, you know, I made sure of is that our son and daughter, they're not going to receive those properties. They're going to be held in trust for their benefit to produce income for them during their lifetime. Now, at the same time, I don't want them to become little bums and say, all right, well, dad's real estate portfolio is going to kick down to me this year, $700,000. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to quit work. And I'm going to play PlayStation all day long because I don't have to work anymore. So in my estate plan says, if you wanted to do that, not that our kids would, but just in case you don't get paid anything. So it incentivizes them to keep working by saying, I'll pay you out as much as you can generate on your own. But if you're not working, you don't get paid unless, you know, you build other circumstances in, you know, if they wanted to be teach or be a policeman, fireman, military service, things like that, stay at home mom, got all that covered. And I have something different managing that. The house, the vehicles, the brokerage account, the cash, they get that outright. Boom, that goes to them. But I want to create a legacy. So when they're gone, that real estate that I've built, worked so hard to build up that portfolio, that'll keep paying dividends to their children and their children's children. And, and hopefully my kids will see the value in that and want to add to it as well. So thinking through <clears throat> that, I think it's really important. Absolutely. I mean, most people don't think that anything's going to, I mean, don't, don't think it's going to happen to them anytime soon, especially if they're young mm -hmm. and you just never know what's going to happen. I've just heard many stories where something happened to somebody and you know, their property was in their name. And so they had to go through the probate process and then there's money tied up in different places. And so, you know, you got to hire attorneys. I mean, you know, something happens to somebody, you're already grieving as it is. So I have to hire attorneys and, and, you know, go through the process of trying to get assets and try and get money and then potentially have people come in and try and fight for it because they think they have have the right to it if it's not in your will or in your state. There's just a lot that can be, you know, that could be cut 
up front by thinking about the people that are potentially going to inherit your assets, right? So I think that's another piece is not only setting up properly to where it, it runs without you or, you know, it kind of goes properly without you there, but also just the 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 mental ang- angst that it's going to create for the errors if it's not set up properly, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. What else? I mean, you talked about asset protection. So, you know, limited liability companies, you know, things of that nature, layering it, if you will. Then you have asset protection and then you have tax planning. I think you also said something about business planning as well. So touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So the business planning side is understanding what the client wants to accomplish and then designing that plan to help them get there. You know, is it not putting so much emphasis on taxation? Is it putting more of the emphasis on the asset protection side? And so the best example I can give you is a lot of our clients maybe have an existing business when they're coming to us and, and they're thinking about a certain strategy, like this one client I've been working with where he thought about setting it up as an S-corp because most people will set things up as S-corporations for that flow-through treatment. And I showed him, say, yeah, you could do that. But here's the thing that with the type of income you're making from that flipping activity that you're engaging in right now, here's what your overall tax liability is going to be. So if you want to grow faster and you don't want to keep using hard money to fund these deals and paying those higher interest rates, why don't you fund more of them yourself? But the problem is, is that at the end of the day, Uncle Sam takes so much out of your pocket, you're still forced into using the hard money lenders. So by changing that and setting it up as a C corporation, you can effectively cut your tax rate by 16% on your income. That 16%, you can turn around then and reinvest to continue to build the business at a faster clip because you're no longer using the hard money lenders. You're getting more money back in your pocket. So back up there, C-Corp, I've never heard, I don't want to say I've never, I think I've heard it a few times maybe, using a C-Corp because if, you know, if I remember back in college, the thing about C-Corps was double taxation, right? You get taxed once up front and then you get taxed again at the, at, at the year end or you know, however that is. So yeah. tell us why some people are set up or should be set up as C-Corporations again. Because if you're going to flip wholesale, any type of active business activity. This isn't for the person that's got a rental portfolio. This is for those investors who are engaging in an active business. So my client that I was just referring to, he's doing really well for himself, $800,000 a year from his flipping activity. That money's flowing down to him. It's getting taxed at 37%, throw another eight to 10% in state taxes on that. He's losing close to 45% of his income. Right. So if you did that, if you made a, say a million dollars to make it simple, you got six or 550 left to invest under that scenario. Whereas if you set up a C corporation and you did the exact same activity through the C corporation, you're going to about have about say $750,000 left to invest. So you'll have an extra $200,000 just in tax savings. Now, every time I have this conversation with someone who has an inexperienced CPA, they bring exactly up that same pushback. Hey, well, double taxation. It's like, great, let's get the CP on the line, run the numbers with. And so we'll go through and we'll run the numbers. And I know the way the numbers work out because I use a C corporation for my own flipping activity and to run my active business, Anderson's Mm -hmm. C corporation. And you end up paying about a percent more when you eventually take out the money as a dividend out of your C corporation, because you're going to pay tax at 20%. How much more did you say? About a percent, percent and a half. Percent, okay. So let me ask you this. Would you like to have access in this case, to an extra $200,000 a year for the next 10 years at 1% or 1.5%. Where else are you going to get that type of money if it's not from the IRS? You're not. You can't so, go out and borrow that at 1.5%. So where does that 200000 come from? It's because you're lending it to yourself and that's... No, it's because your corporation is generating that money and it's taking its t- the tax savings that would have been that you're saving by not having that money come down to you and you're reinvesting it in your corporation because most people you know as you're building your business it's invest 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 to keep growing so when i make a million dollars i end up paying tax a 250 state federal on that $250,000 in taxes i have $750,000 left over if I didn't have that C corp, I'd be hit at about 45% in most cases on taxes. So I'd only have $550,000 left to reinvest. So where does that, I'm sorry, I'm losing it a little bit. Where yeah. is the, where's the $200,000 saved? Is it because tax rates? Okay. Because it's a corporate tax rate, the rates Correct. go are going down, right? 
So as long as you're not taking that money out of the business, right? As long as it stays in the business, yes. then the tax tax rate is lower and you don't have to pay tax the higher taxes until you flow it through and actually pay yourself. Is that what I'm understanding? Correct. So what happens in this scenario, your C corporation would pay tax at a flat 21%. Okay. That's all. Is, is that for any, any income any, level? All income. Okay. 21%. Okay. When you take it out, you pay tax at 20%. Okay. So what you're taking advantage of then when you look at it is for that income that I don't need that I'm reinvesting, I'm paying a flat tax of 21%. And if I'm in a 37 plus your state you know, like I said, 45, which you probably are in yourself. If I if I compare those two, that's a 50% tax saving on that money because I'm just going to reinvest it anyways. So why pay it to the IRS if I can keep it in my own business? Now, a lot of people will say, well, wait a minute. I need some of that money to go out and buy investment real estate. I just don't flip or run an active business. Well, that's fine. Then loan it to yourself. A lot of our larger acquisitions that we ha have made over the past several years have been through loans from my existing business. So for example, I know they're bigger numbers than a lot of people are used to possibly dealing with. I got $2 million in retained earnings sitting there. I'm not using it in the business. I'll loan it out to myself at the current AFR rate plus one, take that money, go and buy real estate with it on the on the personal side. So you're getting, you're still, my mind's blown right now because I've never heard anybody talk about this before. And this could be, this could be a game changer for me because I'm in California, right? I yeah, mean, they, the they, tax they, rates they are, are, are not fun. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that I buy so much real estate and keep it is because of the taxes, because I want to be able to depreciate the renovations and I don't want to pay taxes on the additional income. So sure. I'm keeping, I'm keeping most of the properties I'm buying right now. And so you're saying that again, the corporate tax rate is 21%. Mm -hmm. So 20, at the end of the year, you make a million dollars, 21%. Then when it is paid out to you, you pay the extra 20%. So there are, there, there's going to be some income you need to pay to yourself. I, I imagine there's some kind of rule that you need kind of like an S corp that you need to pay a certain wage or a fair wage. Is that correct? A fair wage? Yeah, well, the, yeah, the salary that you take, that's going to be subject to ordinary income taxes. That's subject to, you know, your your partner's FICA and FUTA, the W-2 stuff. The money that I was referring to is what we, your uh, dividend that you pay yourself out of the company. You know, the owner's draw is another way maybe to, to think about it. Yeah. Like in your business right now, you're you're probably working, you take a W-2 and then you've got $300,000 left over at the end of the year. And if it's an S corp, you make a distribution of that 300 grand, you pay tax on that money. Or even if you don't make the distribution, you still pay tax on that money yep. at your ordinary income tax bracket. Right. With the C corp, that doesn't happen. You still, you take your W-2, whatever you leave, because the, the salary is an expense to the corp. So what I'm referring to is the earnings, net earnings after all expenses, that's going to be, you're going to pay tax there at 21%. And then if you turn around the very next day and say, well, I'm going to distribute it to myself, then you're going to pay tax on that distribution at 20%. And the way to get around that, like you said, is just loaning that money to yourself. Loan. So it's not an actual income you're taking. It's a loan that you're taking. Just you got to make sure you're paying the interest on it, right? Correct. So take someone like yourself. One of the, This is that business planning side. I would ask you, okay, how long do you plan to live in California? Think you might move? Because if you start accumulating that money inside of a C corporation, you say, yeah, in eight or 10 years, my wife and I, we're out of here. Cool. So we'll make sure we preserve as much as we can inside of your C corporation. You won't take anything out now because we know it'll be subject to taxation in California. Instead, we'll hold on to it. You move to a lower tax state, then you start taking that money out. Yeah. Now, is that 20%? Is that based on where you're located? No, that's federal. But what you would be concerned about as well is state. State. Okay. Yeah. So the 20% does not include state tax. No, it does not. Okay. I gotcha. So that would be 20% federal regardless because you're a C corporation. Well, it's dividend income. That's right. So, so does, does that 21, uh, excuse me, 20% go up and down based on your income level? It, yeah, it could go lower based on your income level, but you know, most of the people that are going to be pulling that money out, they're going to be paying tax at 20%. Right. I got gotcha. you. Okay. So federal, and then let's say state tax is 10%. You're paying give or take about 51% if you take it all out or 20, just the 21% if you only take out the corporate tax. Correct. I love this. I love these conversations. <laughs> I think I just saved a lot of money here. Well, see, then you just borrow the money. So in your business, you know, I don't know the numbers, but 
I would say, you know, run, run an analysis. Say if I keep it as a C corp versus an S corp, where am I sitting at the end of the year cash wise? And then that cash, what are you doing with your money? If you're taking it to buy residential property, loan the money out to yourself rather than take a, a dividend, you may be uh, dollars ahead and be able to pick up one or two more deals. hundred percent. I love it. I love it. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Where do we go from here? My mind's blown. So I'm kind of like, man, what, what have I been missing here? Uh, so I have, have to talk have have a talk with my CPA and potentially reach out to you guys as well yeah. um, to help plan that a little bit better. So let's back up. So real estate investors, not all of them make a lot of money, right? I mean, some of them make a decent living. So some of them might be thinking, listen to this, well, you know, the income tax planning, I don't quite make enough asset protection. I only have so many properties. You know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of things that people are probably thinking unless they're just, you know, at a certain level. Mm -hmm. Is there something in particular that you would say is something that'd be universal for anybody, whether they're doing a few deals a year or doing 300 deals a year? Yeah. So first off, we already talked about the tax returns. That's the simple one. Hold your stuff through a partnership, your real estate. So you get a boost when it comes to borrowing. Mm -hmm. The second thing I say is that, you know, right now we have cost seg, of course, with bonus depreciation, which has been the hot ticket for everyone as far as generating tax deductions. So let's say I was, I'm working with a new investor. They've got one or two properties they've acquired and they're wondering, what should I do to reduce my taxes? Well, it depends on where we start working with them. But if you just recently acquired a property and you're still pulling a W-2 40 hours a week, you're never going to qualify as a real estate professional. It just won't happen. And real estate professional means that you could take any real estate losses and apply those to your W-2 income. So if I was pulling down 90K from PG&E and I had a property that I ran a cost segregation with bonus depreciation, which is mean I'm accelerating the depreciation on the property and I'm able to take a, a maybe a third of that value all up front. So let's say that was $35,000 on this property. I could take that $35,000 loss and offset it against the 90K in income I'm pulling in from PG&E. That would be great. But the problem is you have section 469 of the tax code that states you can't do that unless you're a real estate professional. And you can't be a real estate professional if you're working a full-time job. Right. So for most investors, it's nice to do what you're talking about. Hey, yeah, let's go out there. We'll, we'll take the depreciation. We'll offset all of our real estate income and we'll carry the losses forward. What I'll typically do is look at the, the situation and ask the investor, do you think you, A, are you going to self-manage? Are you willing to commit to self-manage the property for this year for a while? And if they say yes, then I say, is that property eligible to be a short-term rental? Do you think you could turn it into a short-term rental? And if the answer to that is, okay, we're into it, they, they're willing to do it, then I would suggest that you use that property as a short-term rental. And as long as you self-manage that property and you spend 100 hours a year, and that's more than anyone else. So you, you got to go in there. You should probably do the turns when, when the people are leaving or get somebody in there that can get in and out within an hour and a half or two hours on a turn. So it's less than seven days. The average rental is less than seven days. You spend a hundred hours more than anybody else in the, the that's worked on your properties. Then you can free up those deductions, that $35,000 that I just said, or 30,000, whatever I said, now you're in a different category. You can take those losses and apply it against your PG and income. You no longer have to be a real estate professional. Some people call it the short-term rental loophole. And it's one that when I'm working with an investor, they really see the benefits there and like, oh yeah, I can do that. And if they're willing to commit, I mean, as long as you place a property in service, you don't have to do it for the entire year. You just have to do it from whenever you start through the end of the year you qualified. If you want to turn it back into a long-term rental later, go right ahead. But that year you ran as a short-term rental, that's how you cover it. And then even more so, let's say you bought a property and you decide, well, I have to rehab it. Great. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to first do a cost seg before you do the rehab so we can get what's called a partial asset disposition. That means if you're going to rip off the roof, you're going to replace the bathroom, kitchen, whatever it is, I can get you a full deduction for the value of those components plus the cost of removal. Mm -hmm. So let's assume that the cost to re to pull out my kitchen um, and the roof and, and the value of <clears> it, 
CP or the appraiser determines is 40 grand. You get a $40,000 tax deduction. Then you come in, you remodel it and you spend 80,000 on the remodel. Well, we'll come in, we'll run a second cost seg on the remodel and get you another deduction for $80,000. So you basically double up your deduction in one year by taking what you ripped out of the property and deducting it, and then taking what you put on the property and deduct it. So there's a lot you can do. So with those first time investors that are just getting started, they don't even know about this other side of it. Uh, I was told you I was teaching the convention uh, in Vegas this past weekend, about 500 people showed up and I started, you know, just going down that road. I said, now, how many of you in here have done this, bought a property, decided you wanted to rehab it and miss this opportunity? Of the people that raise their, that that have done that, about 70, 80 percent of them never even heard about it and lost out on that tax deduction right there. So it's just you know you got to issue spot. You got to know where the where the opportunities are and work with people who are investors like myself, my partners, and a lot of people that work in my firm. We invest in real estate. So what I'm telling you is the same thing I'm doing. You know, my own properties. I I got this 165 unit in Winston Salem right now. I'm going through and rehabbing. But before I did that, I ran a cost seg on it so I could pick up the partial asset disposition because I don't qualify as a real estate professional. So you do it that way, you can uh, generate more tax deductions. That just means more money back in your pocket. Yeah, so many loopholes. So many loopholes. I mean, we could go we could go around and around about you know all the tax savings, but what it comes down to it is is finding something that works. Because I've I actually have someone that comes to our events and teaches and coaches and things of that nature. And they're going to make, I think she said like 3 million this year. And she's like, I hate writing a seven figure check. And I'm like, why are you writing a seven figure check? You should have figured this out a long time ago. And so she's kind of backpedaling, trying to figure out tax deductions and, and all of that. So getting it planned up front to make sure that when you do have substantial income or even just income in general, because I've been doing this for 20 years now. I've barely ever pay taxes. There's like one or two years where I wasn't able to uh, to get it to where I needed to be. And I, I paid a decent amount of taxes and it was still only you know less than six figures. But I mean, today, I mean, the income that I have is almost none of it's taxable and it, it's sizable. And so getting that set up and getting that set up right and getting with someone like Clint, they can help you plan that is going to save you so much time, energy. And imagine getting in the game Looking back 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road, how much money you're saving every year if you can take that money and compound it over and over and over because you're saving the money, you're taking it and reinvesting it. It's substantial if you run the numbers on it, right? So good stuff, Clint. So we're going to start wrapping it up here. I kind of want to get into your business and how you run 500 employees. So I'll just, just give me a high level overview of that. How do you go... From being a loan attorney to 500 employees and manage all of that? Because some people, when they have five employees, they can't manage it. So high level overview of how you manage, manage your business. You hire people that are smarter than you. That's it. And, you know, I realized that about eight years ago, that as it was growing, my skill set is speaking, working with investors, and I like to invest myself. It's not managing people. And so as the business started to grow, I, I realized I needed a whole new skill set. Somebody that has that experience that can come in and put the systems and processes in place that would allow us to grow. So just started hiring people that were smarter than me in those areas. And then it's the mental side where you have to step back and realize, you know, you can't be involved in the day-to-day -day like you used to. And that's the most difficult part. When you hear about stuff that's going on inside of the company that you don't necessarily agree with, and you're like, fire them. I want them gone. And they'll say, no, 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 Clint, you understand saying we have to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. Well, when I was small, I could do that. But now when you're bigger, things change. You just got to step back and say, hey, the business is doing what it is today, not so much because of what you've done, but it's because of what these other people are doing for you to help you continue to grow. And it's stressful at times, but it's also once you recognize that, it's also a relief, you know? To, to be there. I used to know everyone's everyone by name and their face. And now when I come to our, our we have quarterly meetings or, or annual meetings and you see 450 people, 500 people there, you're like, I don't know, 90% of them now. Right, right. Which yeah. is a good thing, right? I yeah. mean, o overall, overall. Well, fantastic. Well, congrats on the business you built. How can people get a hold of you if they want to talk about tax planning, estate planning, asset protection? How do they get a hold of you and your team? Well, we'll put a link in the show notes. All they have to do is go there and they can just click on that link 
and it'll bring him to a page to set up a strategy session, and then they can uh, set up a strategy session. Or if you want, you can join me. I, I teach Saturday events on live stream, so you can come there via Zoom, and they're typically every two to three weeks, and you'll learn about all these strategies in more depth. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, congrats on the success and the growth. What you're doing is definitely needed. A lot of people don't think about what you do because they're so busy doing deals, but you know, it only takes one thing to happen for the asset protection, you know, for the people to be like, man, I wish I would have protected my assets. And then obviously just, you know, getting the tax bills each year, people need to really think about that and how they can get that reduced or even eliminated through some strategies that we talked about. So thanks again for being on Clinton. I appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll touch base soon and um, hopefully we'll collaborate in the future. Sure. Likewise. Thanks. All right. We'll talk soon.